Hello, everybody, and welcome to this supplemental lecture segment uh, for 6838. Now, we just spent our last lecture developing a Laplacian operator that is really just a matrix that works for triangulated surfaces. But in our class, we kind of ping pong back and forth between low dimensional geometry processing style applications and high dimensional machine learning. So I thought in this extra lecture segment, I would derive a Laplacian operator that's quite popular in the machine learning literature, for example, for manifolds of data embedded in some high dimensional space. Now, unfortunately, in this setting, we have much less structure to work with. So a very typical setup here is that we're given some data set of points, which are really just points. You know, they're just isolated positions, maybe with some noise, maybe not, what have you. But the idea is that our points here, they comprise, or they're sampled from some underlying manifold. So for example, here, I'm showing you a bunch of points on the plane, but they're kind of sampled from a curve. And essentially, what, what Belkin and Yogi are after in this, this paper we'll, we'll cover very quickly, is a Laplace-style operator that is trying to capture the Laplacian that's associated to the underlying manifold, if one should exist. Now, the strategy we covered in class using finite element method is really cool, but it doesn't really work here because we don't have a way to compute integrals over our manifold. We don't even know where our manifold is. We just have some kind of sparse collection of points. And so we have to use a different starting point to get a reasonable point cloud Laplacian matrix, which is gonna be a matrix of size equal to the number of points here. So our starting point for a point cloud Laplacian is the heat equation, which is a partial differential equation that is governing the diffusion of heat over a surface. So we're gonna have some function u, which is a function of x, which is like the position on your manifold, and t, which is time. And essentially the heat equation takes the distribution of heat at time zero and tells you how it diffuses out as a function of time, just the same as we covered the wave equation in class. In particular, it's quite simple. So it's du dt equals minus Laplace of u x, oh, oops, oh no, xt. Ah. Man, this paint gets everywhere very easily. Okay, so this is minus the Laplacian of u x t. So uh, notice that the only difference between the heat equation and the wave equation is that the wave equation has two derivatives in time and the heat equation has one derivative in time. And also remember that this Laplacian is only taken in the x-coordinate. That's the convention that we're taking in our class. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is just convince ourselves that we know how to solve this thing. So here's how we're gonna do it. Uh, we're going to take an eigenbasis, which is just the set of eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. So in particular, uh, we're gonna have a bunch of functions phi with the property that Laplacian applied to phi k is equal to some lambda uh, eigenvalue lambda k times phi k, like that. Um, one fact, which we haven't really proven in this class, but we're going to use, is just that you can take any square integral function and write it in this uh, basis. Um, so what does that mean? That means that any fixed time t, I can write the following. I can say, okay, well, u of xt is going to be equal to a sum over k of uk of t, right, because the coefficient might change, times phi k of x. And again, the basic point here is that like, if I freeze time, then this is just a function over my domain, and all I'm doing is writing that function in the phi k basis. But now, of course, time is moving forward, so I have to think of those coefficients as changing as a function of time. Okay, so if I write things in this basis, and I look back at the heat equation, well, then what do I find? Well, okay, the left-hand side of the heat equation is du dt, so that's going to be the sum over k of uk prime of t, right? That's the derivative in t, phi k of x, is equal to, well, minus the Laplacian of u, okay? So that's minus the sum over k 
of u k of t, right? This is a scalar times Laplacian of phi k of x. But I strategically chose phi k to be an eigenfunction. So of course, this is the same as minus the sum over k, u k of t, lambda k phi k of x. OK, so the phi k's here form an orthonormal basis. And notice that I've written a function of x in that basis on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, which means their coefficients must be equal. So in other words, actually, I have an ordinary differential equation to solve u k prime, right? That's why I have the coefficient of phi k on the left-hand side equals uh, minus lambda k u k, which is the coefficient of phi k on the right-hand side. And this is an easy uh, differential equation to solve. In particular, one thing that you can check at home is that that means that u k of t is equal to u naught k, like the value of u k at time 0, that's like the initial conditions of our PDE, times e to the minus lambda k t. Okay? So why do we know that? Well, take a look. If I, if I differentiate this with respect to t, well, this coefficient will remain the same, and I'll get a minus lambda k factor coming out, which is exactly what I would expect. So that motivates a particular object, which we'll define, which is the heat kernel. Okay? So we're going to define the heat kernel. which is going to be kind of like the amount of heat that diffuses from one point to another in a fixed amount of time. Uh, in particular, I've got my formula here. The heat kernel is a function ht, which is a function of two points on our manifold. And it can be written as uh, the sum over k of e to the minus lambda k t phi k of x phi k of y. Okay, and so the reason that, that we kind of like the heat kernel uh, is that it actually allows us to do kind of a cool thing, which is the following. It's, it gives us a nice close form for u, which looks like convolution. Essentially, it looks like the integral uh, over our, our manifold m of the heat kernel t of x comma y. This is a function of x, so we're integrating over y here. Uh, integrated against essentially u of 0 comma x. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, comma y. dy. Okay, so the basic point here is that if uh, I write the heat kernel in this way, which is kind of borrowed from our closed form solution uh, to the heat equation that I wrote on the right hand side, or on the left hand side here, then essentially I can convince myself quite easily that u as a function of time is just the integral of u naught against the heat kernel, which is itself a function of time. So one thing that's nice is that in Euclidean space, the heat kernel is known in closed form. Uh, we're not going to derive it here. But essentially, on uh, Rn, we know that uh, the heat kernel uh, looks like the following. I'm sorry I'm working for my notes today, but that's, uh, that's why. Uh, the heat kernel in x comma y is equal to 1 over 4 pi t to the n over 2 times e to the minus norm of x minus y squared, all that divided by 4t. Okay, so this is the heat kernel in uh, n-dimensional space. And it's basically, you know, if you're a statistician, you recognize this object. This is a Gaussian distribution or a bell curve. So essentially what it's saying is that heat diffusion is the same as convolving against the Gaussian, which is absolutely true. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use this heat kernel formula to motivate an approximation of the Laplacian of a manifold uh, that essentially can be computed from a point cloud, which is pretty nice because Point clouds are the kind of thing that we get as input in a messy machine learning application.
Okay, so that's our, our task for the remainder of our little discussion here. So, in particular, what Belkin and Yogi make use of is a useful asymptotic formula. Unfortunately, again, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of hand waving, but I think this formula is actually believable, which is to say that on a manifold, we'll say our manifold is m and it's little m dimensional here, the heat kernel is well approximated by this heat kernel in our m, um, so long as, as time is small. So in particular, uh, there's this kind of funny, interesting formula, which is that the heat kernel as a function of x, y, is equal to essentially exactly the same thing as the heat kernel we had for Rn. So it's like 4 pi t to the minus now m, which is the intrinsic dimensionality of our manifold, over 2 times e to the... Now here's where, where things are kind of interesting. So now we're going to assume that our manifold is embedded, so we can actually compute Euclidean norms like this. Uh, which is identical to our formula. And essentially, Belkin and Yogi just show that the heat kernel of a manifold is equal to this quantity multiplied by some function phi of x comma y. I'm sorry, they, they use the notation phi for something other than eigenfunction here. I apologize for reusing the same Greek letter. Uh, plus big O of t where this function phi satisfies a particular property. Um, namely, it is smooth, and phi of x comma x, like the diagonal of this function, sorry, I keep saying one thing and writing another. Phi of x comma x is identically equal to one for all x. Okay, so what is this saying? Well, if you, if you back up a bit, what it's saying is that when x and y are close, the heat kernel just looks like the heat kernel from m dimensional space scaled by the sum of two things, one of which is close to one and the other is very close to zero. So long as x and y are close and t is close to zero. Okay, so now we're in pretty good shape. So essentially what it's saying is for small t and uh, near zero um, distance between x and y, this heat kernel is basically approximately equal to just these, uh, these terms here. Maybe I'm gonna be lazy and not copy them over. Okay, so remember our heat equation, right? It's du dt equals minus Laplacian times u. Belkin and Yogo do something really sneaky, which is they say, okay, so what does that mean? That means that we can actually get an approximation of the Laplacian by sort of starting with the solution to the heat equation and working backward. This is a really sneaky trick, I kind of like it. So in particular, for small t, we can do the following, which is u, the Laplacian of u, x comma t, is roughly equal to minus du dt, right? So this is kind of like u, we're gonna say for t close to zero, it looks a lot like u of x zero minus u of x t divided by t, right? Because this is a divided difference approximation of the first derivative and it works for small t. Okay, so uh, let's, let's fill in our approximation here. So we have a one over t factor. We have uh, u of x zero. Um, okay. Uh, right. And, and so now uh, what do we have to do? Well, we have to m minus the uh, solution to the, the heat equation here. But that's just the integral against the heat kernel. So roughly that's minus 4 pi t to the minus m over 2, right, that's this coefficient, times the integral over our domain of e to the minus norm of x minus y squared over 4t times u of y uh, 
I guess y zero zero d y. Okay. So um, right. Well, now we're now we're in pretty good shape. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it, but we are. So so first of all, if we assume the, the you know t is really really small, right? So then, you know, the Laplacian of u uh, uh, at t is roughly, you know, Laplacian of u at t equals zero plus some small term that vanishes, right? So then, what do we really have? Well, we don't have a function. We can't deal with the Laplacian on our manifold because we only have an isolated set of points on our manifold. So what do we do? Well, we say, okay. Almost all of our terms here are okay. You know, t is all right. The only issue here is this integral. So what we're going to do is just approximate it. In particular, we can approximate it with the sum. Uh, so what we can do is say that this is roughly one over your set of points to uh, the sum of uh, well e to the minus x i minus x j quantity squared divided by 4t times just the value of our function u at vertex j. Uh, assuming now that we're going to evaluate our Laplacian at some vertex i, like that. All right, and so the basic point here, and k here is going to be the number of points in our point cloud. So again, what's going on here? We have a big cloud of points which are sampled from some low dimensional manifold. We have a function u whose values we know at those points and we're trying to approximate what the Laplacian of our function u should be. What do we do? We plug in this heat kernel formula and that actually gives us some expression for what the Laplacian of u should be which is the difference between the value at zero and essentially a weighted average of values nearby where the weights are coming from uh, Gaussian. Yeah, so in particular, uh, by the way, oftentimes we truncate this sum to, you know, just points that are nearby because this term vanishes pretty quickly. So essentially, this leads us to a set of weights w, i, j, which are equal to um, e to the minus norm x, i minus x, j squared over 4t. And usually, again, we, we do it only when, when uh, xi and xj are close, just for numerical kind of computational reasons. And then zero otherwise. And then essentially, you can write Belkin and Yogi's uh, uh, Laplacian as the graph Laplacian of our, our set of points with weights coming from, from w here. So what ends up happening is you, you have a Laplacian whose diagonal is minus the sum of the w's, which are the off-diagonal elements. Okay, so, uh, and, uh, right. so, so that gives us a Laplacian operator for functions on a point cloud. And the nice thing about this operator, unlike um, the one that we developed in class for triangle meshes, is that it's computable for point clouds. Essentially, we didn't need all this topological structure like triangles that we needed for the finite element method. So to review a little bit, what we did is we started with the heat equation, came up with a closed form solution to the heat equation, and based on that closed form solution, wrote down a formula for the heat kernel. Now, the nice thing is that the heat kernel is known in closed form in Euclidean space. So what Belkin and Yogi do is they essentially use a perturbative formula that says so long as the amount of time that we diffuse is infinitesimally small, uh, then there's a nice approximation formula which says that the heat kernel of a manifold is roughly, well, the same as the heat kernel of the intrinsic uh, space of the manifold scaled by the sum of two things, one of which vanishes for small time and the other of which basically goes to one as long as points are nearby. And we say, OK, so in that case, we can reverse engineer a Laplacian by looking at divided difference between heat diffusion and the original data. And what does that end up being? Well, it ends up being the original data evaluated at that vertex minus uh, 
some integral, but the integral can be reasonably approximated with a weighted sum where the weights come from this heat kernel formula that we have. So at the end of the day, we managed to get a Laplace operator without needing um, triangles or any kind of topology, which is pretty nice. Now, what are the challenges in using the, this operator? This is an extremely popular construction. Essentially, at the end of the day, what it's telling you is that if you want, if you have a point cloud and you want the Laplacian of that point cloud, all you have to do is evaluate pairwise Gaussians between the pairs of points and construct a matrix where those are the entries. And then, you know, down the diagonal, uh, do something so that the rows sum to zero. That's really great, and it's extremely practical and easy to use, but convincing yourself that it's a convergent approximation of the Laplacian is quite tricky for a number of reasons. Um, in particular, when H is really, really, or when T is really, really close to zero, that's when this approximation holds, but if T goes to zero, then these coefficients vanish and our approximation becomes numerically unstable. And similarly, essentially, we're using the fact that these integrals are just over little neighborhoods of x and y. If our point cloud isn't sampled densely enough, then that might not really be a safe assumption. More importantly, so okay, so there's two parameters that you gotta cope with, like the neighborhood size and the diffusion time, where if you diffuse too much, then this approximation doesn't hold anymore. If you diffuse too little, then you've got numerical instability and, and your points aren't sampled densely enough. There's actually, Yet another challenge which, with using these point cloud Laplacians, which often is not addressed in practice very carefully, which is this number right here, which is m. <laughs> and remember that m is the intrinsic dimensionality of your data, right? Like this is like, if I have a, you know, a tangent plane, it would be the dimensionality of the tangent plane of this thin slice of, of, of n-dimensional space. Now, I drew this nice suggestive picture where I've got a one-dimensional submanifold of R2, so like M here would equal one. But generally, people in machine learning are using this for data where there's a manifold assumption, or sometimes we say a manifold hypothesis, which is that your data is sampled from some low-dimensional manifold embedded in this high-dimensional space, but we don't know the dimensionality, the intrinsic dimensionality of that object very typically. I mean, that would be a weird thing to know. Um, so there's often a lot of guesswork, cross-validation, and so on that goes into choosing M in practice unless you just happen to know the intrinsic dimensionality of your space. So in any event, this is a very different style of Laplace operator, but I think it's worth knowing because it shows up a lot in, in semi-supervised machine learning and other cases where you're trying to detect a Laplacian-style manifold structure of some cloud of data points which are sampled uh, in a high dimensional space, but really form some low dimensional slice. In follow up papers to this one, um, there are proofs of convergence as the sampling density gets really, really high as long as you choose T really carefully relative to the density of your points. Uh, and this operator gets used all over the place. So it's definitely one that's worth knowing. Okay, so with that, next time we'll talk about applications of the little posh operator. <laughs>